Welcome back YouTube. I'm Dan, this is Steel, so you know what time it is, Dan of Steel time. Today what we're going to be covering is a little bit of information for you guys regarding how to get your metal moving fast and efficiently when you're trying to do your blade making. So this is something that I hold very dear to my heart because I'm 40 years old and my elbows are killing me from swinging a hammer all the time and the reason they're killing me is because I haven't been very good at it. So I need to share these tips and uh, tricks of the trade with you guys to save you the same fate that I'm currently suffering now. What it all boils down to is pressure. So I'm going to cover in this video how to move metal more efficiently using your hammer and anvil because I suspect a lot of you like me in the early days were beaten away for hours on end and possibly not really getting that far. You will get there, you'll get the desired effect but you'll probably spend three to four times, maybe even more, the amount of time trying to get there than you actually need to once you've shown the proper techniques. I'm also going to cover my seven ton log splitter press, difficult to say, and I'll show you the existing die that I've got in there and how I'm going to make some new die inserts to help draw out my billets. Because as a lot of you all know who follow me on Facebook and Twitter, Instagram, etc., I make a lot of copper Q my billets now. And what I found is it really is, when, once you start going into these sort of areas, efficiency is key. Uh, you don't want to be spending hours and hours and hours on something when a few simple upgrades, a, few, a little bit of brain power can save you hours and hours of work. So without going on too much more, why don't we take a look at the log splitter and I'll describe to you exactly what it is I'm gonna try and achieve today. Uh, this is very much a prototype, but if it works, I'll probably make a more robust version of it. How, having said that, if it works and it doesn't appear to be buckling in any way, I'll just stick with it. So let's take a look. Thanks for tuning in, guys. Remember, share this with your new friends, subscribe, like, all that good stuff, because they too will really benefit from this. Let's get started. So here we are over at the workbench, and as you can see, this is my log splitter. I've opted here in the UK to go for a Titan 7-ton log splitter, and what I opted to do was make a few modifications to it, as you've probably seen a lot of other people do. But I've done it the Dan of Steel way, looked at it a little bit differently, and this is what I've come up with. So at first, I'll share the basic upgrades with you. Now, the unit itself comes with a cage to go around it because it's designed for splitting logs. And I don't want that cage in place because I need the side access. I need to be able to get in here and I need to be able to squish metal. That cage is obviously designed so that when a log splits, it has the potential with the kinetic energy in there to ping out the side and strike you. But that isn't something that concerns me because I'm not actually splitting anything. I'm just squashing metal. So I feel perfectly safe not having that feature on. But what I did do was I used part of that particular cage frame to create a level bed here. Now, on all log splitters, they're designed, they're dished so that the log will actually sit, it sit in there, which I found was causing me issues with the alignment of my die here. Now, these die are just made from railway track, but what they want to do is wobble as the piston contracts in. So, simply using a piece of that flat steel, I cut it, bent the edges, and sit it on here. And what that does is it allows these die to move in a nice linear way without any deviation from its path. So that was upgrade number one that I did. Then the die themselves, the key to these is very much the fact that you want to be able to change them quite quickly. So just taking a load of scrap steel that I had from the van der Sander build and also the Revolution 2x72 build. This is all 10 mil plate, 6 mil plate, whatever I had laying around. I made these simple die, which as you can see, insert directly over the top of the original setting. So if I ever wanted to take this back to being a log splitter again, of course I could do. So that's very much the key to this. Everything needs to be good and strong and solid. Um, use plate here, 
the plate was simply put in place, clamped using whatever clamps you've got or magnets and then welded in position. But I did put a couple of shims in there. Obviously you want that to be able to slide up and down like so without getting trapped in position. So put a couple of pieces of shim material in there, uh, old Coke can, that works perfectly well. Just cut an old Coke can up, slip that in there, weld it all up, pop the Coke can out and it'll give you just that enough, just enough tolerance for that to be nice and easy to work with. Then what we've got here is a piece of 50 mil by 50 mil box steel. That's five millimeters thick. So again, nice and substantial. I simply cut a wedge in here and then welded that to these plates. And then you've got the railway track, which obviously I welded the two by two to that. Um, everything I did, I calculated in such a way that when this piston moves forward here, Obviously you've got the potential for this plate that I've put in to catch on the back. So I've designed everything in such a way to make sure that that cannot ever buckle up. I've given myself clearance there. So as this piston moves, it will never make contact with that sacrificial plate that I've put in. Another key thing for you guys to remember. This particular one, very much done in the same way. This is just a three mil plate steel that I've followed the contours of the original part of the uh, log splitter itself, directly welded the railway to this side, and then simply removed a bolt here, drilled a hole through, and used that bolt to hold it in place. So if I give you a quick demonstration now, just of how it moves backwards and forwards, you'll see how straight it is, and that will then lead me on to my other upgrade, which was making it single hand use. Because many of you will be aware, you have a handle here, and you have a button here, and you have to be able to use both at the same time to actually get the piston to move. So I made some upgrades there, very, very simple. You know me guys, that's the way I like things, as simple as possible. So here we go. Simply depress the lever, push the button. And there it is. Runs straight and true every time and gives me a beautiful squish. As I just said, I like simple. Perhaps that's a reflection of my character. So what I did was with this original handle, I found out that it was simply a screw on plastic knob behind this guard here. I'll do a little zoom in on that a little bit later on and we'll put that into the editing process. But basically all I did was unscrewed that plastic handle. I then took some thin plate steel like so. This is approximately 40 mil wide by four mil thick. Drilled a hole in, slotted that over where the old plastic handle used to go on. A simple nut and bolt um, installation. Made a slight bend out here, welded another piece on there. And all I did that for was to make sure that the handle when being depressed was in range of the button on the side here that you need. So just one more time, there we go. Depress, squeeze, piston moves. So simple. No, I've seen a lot of people do these things and they've got fancy pulley systems and foot levers and all sorts of stuff, which are absolutely great if you want to spend the time and effort doing that. But this really is super quick and easy. It took me all of five minutes to do this and I'm in one handed operation, which I think you'll agree is 100% the way to go. Well, we've got the handle covered there. But what I'm showing you now is a standard default. So this is the piston in its fully retracted position. If I'm gonna be working a lot of steel in a day, obviously I don't wanna make up that ridiculous amount of distance every single time I try and do a squish because I'm losing the heat in the material and it's causing me to lose efficiency. So what we've done up this end, again, I'll do a little zoom in for you, is I'm going to depress, squish, And when I release, it goes all the way back there. Absolutely no good whatsoever. So with a simple ring and thumb screw mechanism, what we can do now is depress the lever, release the button around about there. That's a reasonable distance for us to do. And then simply, I move my little sleeve along, tighten my thumb screw, get it nice and tight. So when I release this lever now and it wants to go back to the position, it simply holds like so. 
So now, for future use. Look how quick and easy that is. I'll show you this in a little bit more detail. Some machines come with this. This particular one did, but if yours didn't, it's very, very easy to make one. So why don't we go ahead, take a look at that in a bit more detail now. Okay, so these railway, um, they're approximately two inches wide and it's brilliant for the initial squish when I'm making my billets, just, just to get things to nip together. However, they don't really aid me in the drawing out process. Um, you, you would literally be there forever and a day just trying to get that thing drawn out and um, thinned up a little bit, if you will. So what I've gone ahead and done is I've started these little prototypes that I'm on now using a little bit of uh, thin steel that I've got knocking around again. This is obviously very rough at the moment, but you see the basic principle of what it is I'm trying to achieve here. And essentially I've designed these so that they will fit directly over the top so I don't have to take things apart. And using some round stock, I'll put a shim underneath here and I'll weld them into position. And what that's going to do is that's going to give me the ability now to draw my material out. And how that works is, because this is a radius face and I've still got the seven tons of pressure going through this machine, obviously all of that seven ton of force is now going to be projected onto a much smaller surface. So effectively, we're getting a more powerful squish now because um, it's, it's focused into a smaller area. So I've stopped at that point because I figured I may as well do the rest of the fabrication and bring you guys along for the ride. So that is essentially how it's going to look. I've got the other one in preparation here. I just need to weld up around. I'll weld on the inside as well. I'll then cut all of this excess off using a grinder. I will take these pieces over to the van der sander. I'll clean up these edges a little bit just so I don't leave any sharpness there. And then we'll go ahead and give it a test. But this is very much the key to what I want to talk to you today uh, about increasing efficiency and making your tools work for you. And this is very much transferable across to the anvil, which like I said, we'll cover a little bit later on and I'll explain that in full at the time.
Okay, here we are. And what we're looking at now is you saw the basic fab there. But what I need to do now is make sure that these pieces can't twist when the two round sections come together. So what I'm doing is simply going through my scrap pile, finding what I can, and this will all be cleaned up obviously. But what I've done is taken some scrap steel, cut it so that it fits either side of the back side of the railway there, and simply I should be able to offer these pieces up and drop them into place, which will stop these from twisting. Well, that's the plan anyway. So when the two faces come together, we get a nice even squish. So that's that side roughed in. We'll do this side now, and then we'll give it a little test before we do a full clean up and make everything nice and pretty. Well, here we go. We've got the prototype die all roughed in. As I say, I'll be rebuilding these with some more substantial steel, but we'll just test the principle now and see if the two come together. So wish me luck. Yeah, the basic principle is there. Looks like this should do the job. Okay, we'll uh, go ahead, heat some steel up, throw it in there and see what happens. Things are looking good so far. So when we get to anywhere above 985 degrees, what I'm gonna do is, because I'm filming here alone, I'll make a break in the footage shortly, move the camera round to where the press is, and I'm gonna to demonstrate to you first the initial squishes I do just with the railway. Um, that will give you a benchmark, if you like, of just how much squish we actually get with a seven ton press. I'll then go back in, I'll reheat the billet and I'll come back to the press again with the new die in there with the rounds and we'll see just how much more movement we get in that steel. What I'll also do for you is I'll measure one of my standard billets prior to the drawing out process and I'm only going to give it one pass just so we can measure the distance that the steel moves because it'll be interesting for me as well. It's not something I've actually done before but it'll be more of a visual indicator to show you guys what it is I'm trying to get at today in this video. Here we're looking at one of my billets as it, uh, prior to any sort of squishing or working, just freshly welded up and eight inches long or 200 millimeters. So that's our benchmark. That's what we're starting with. And we'll go ahead now and make that initial smush. Get into the exciting part. So what we'll do, we'll go ahead and we'll drop this light here so we can see more of the colors now. And I shall grab my tongs, come over to the heat oven and retrieve us a nice, beautiful glowing orange billet here. And we'll go ahead and we'll demonstrate exactly what happens. There we go, that's one single pass. So I'll just throw this down here on the bench. Go ahead and move the camera down for you guys so you can see what we're looking at. Obviously I'm gonna be very careful here. I think I'll even put some gloves on because that thing is still super hot. And we'll just take a quick look. I shouldn't think you'll see much change at all. Nope, still at eight inches there, 200 millimeters. All we've really done is we've compressed all of those layers together. This is actually a copper Q my billet here that we're working with. So now I'll flick the camera off. I'll go ahead, throw this back in the heat stick the new die in and we'll take another look see what we come up with many of you may be wondering why i'm using the oven today uh, for this and the simple answer to that is control measures so in order for this to be an accurate test what i wanted to ensure was that i hit the exact same temperatures on 
both the flat die and these new die that I'm about to show you here. Already I can see a huge difference. So focusing that seven tons of force into a smaller area is giving me a lot more metal movement there. I'm drawing this billet out really fast. Really quite beautiful. So, so far, the principle is looking good. Right, let's just uh, throw this down on the bench. We shall move the camera down. Where are we? Here. Just zoom out a little bit. Get the old gloves again. And see how that's changed things. And that's just one single pass. So we are, we've gained nearly 10 millimeters there. 10 millimeters being, what's that? Coming up for half an inch with a single pass there. So I think that's proven the point. What we're going to go ahead and do now is, I'm not going to continue heating this up, but I just want to talk you through some basic principles on how you can convert this that we've seen here to your anvil and hammer. Okay, let's go ahead and get that set up. Moving to the anvil now, um, we've just seen over on the press how the same amount of force concentrated into a smaller area will move metal faster. So how can we apply that to your anvil? Well, that's what we're gonna go through now. So I'm gonna get that camera set up so it's positioned down here on the anvil where you can see everything that's happening and just go through a couple of basic strikes with you and hopefully everything will fall into place. Now, it may be that you're doing this already, in which case I apologize, but for the new guys, this really is a lifesaver, guys. It'll get you up and running super fast. So let's go ahead, get some hot steel out here and take a look at what happens. So here we go. So many of you, when working on an anvil, working it nice and flat like so. However, taking the principle that we saw over on the press, if we now use the edge of our anvil, so we've concentrated the area there, take our hammer, we're focusing that force into that smaller area, just like we did on the heat press there. Then we can come back to the flat, take out all of those little grooves that we just put in there, and then work the edge again. Now obviously, the more angle you put on here, the more impact it will have, but I'm really not having to swing this hammer hard at all, and I'm getting that metal moving super fast. So that's something I want you to bear in mind. Of course, you can use the horn of the anvil as well if you have a horn, but you're not focusing uh, the pressure where you want to focus it. So these are my top tips for you guys. If you haven't tried it, I suggest you do give it a try. And if you like what you've heard and seen here today, please leave a comment. Your support means so much to me. And if you want me to continue to develop these videos, with these little tips and tricks, please hit the subscribe, turn on the notifications, and be sure to come back for some more. I appreciate your time today, guys. It's been a good one. Remember, make it real.